how do you get to that kind of API that Kubernetes has that allows you to do what you've successfully achieved, which is to come up with a version of the software that you don't have to worry about anymore because it does it good enough. <laughs> I'm putting words into your mouth slightly over overplaying what you said, but you nearly said that. So, so, so you know, you, you've got this, this this great API that's stable that people, millions of people, presumably all around the world, are interacting with, and that's a hard thing to do. You know, the model that I always have in the back of my head when I'm thinking a bit those big public APIs are operating systems. You know, you get an operating system. You mentioned Linux. You get Linux out there. You've got a stable API that's been stable for years in some places. And you have an approach to being able to add new things and grow it in, 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 in disciplined, careful ways. I'd like you to just talk, you, you are probably, you, know, you have experience, personal experience of doing that, of designing those sorts of you know, publicly available APIs that if you change, you're going to break hundreds of thousands of people's code. So, so yeah. how, how do you go about thinking about that and doing that? and achieving it the same way we do this for programming languages <clears throat> if you have a standard library you have some contract with the ecosystem sometimes you even write it down here's our sla we will never break backwards compatibility that could be your stance kubernetes has this stance once a api goes 1.0 we don't change it and so this is why kubernetes in its early days we always had alpha beta and v1 we also have categories of APIs. So we have core APIs. These are the ones that we feel that the system must have in place <clears throat> to work. So like RBAC, um, the concept of a pod, which is a running instance of your application. <clears throat> then you have things that are called apps. These would be things like deployment objects. And those actually came from Red Hat, right? Red Hat decided to build a PaaS on top of Kubernetes. So if you think about Kubernetes being this very low level standard library of infrastructure design, then a pass like OpenShift would be an implementation that actually adds additional features to it. And they decided, and they found a good sweet spot of an API that said, what happens if you build an update mechanism into and writing an application? So we end up with the deployment objects. But we were really careful to make sure we understood what things were considered standard core library components that were composable into higher level constructs. But also we realized that unlike a lot of infrastructure systems that came before, Kubernetes also has an extensible framework that says you can design your own API and do your own implementation. So while Kubernetes does ship out of the box, things like jobs that you can run, cron jobs, uh, a static web server, that's up to you. But you can also just define a new type, literally. Right, it's called custom resource definition. And what that does is it takes pressure off the standard library that we don't need to implement everything on behalf of everyone else. Yeah. You can decide that you have a new API, you decide it's schema, you decide what promises you wanna keep, you decide the version, and then you implement the implementation of that API using any programming language you want. And here's the trick, you don't even have to implement it using a container. You can totally just register your API inside of Kubernetes and you automatically get watch semantics, or you can just pull the API for state changes and you can implement it using a VM or a serverless function on Lambda if that's the way you want to implement uh, that particular contract. Cool. So 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 I, I one of the reasons that I wanted to start down this this path and talk to you about this was because this seems to be one of those ideas to me that is that 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 teams or you know in other organizations that are not building those kinds of public APIs necessarily but can learn a lot from because what we're talking okay. about here is API design protocol design um, you know designing things with good separation of concerns and nice abstract you know um, uh, approaches where you can kind of hide the detail of what's going on and allow people to interact with it and take advantage of the services that you provide. So this is this, you know, you apply this kind of thinking on a small, I would say, I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but I would say that you apply the same kind of thinking on a smaller scale when you're doing things like trying to trying to create a platform in a platform team in an organization and, and so on. So that kind of design thinking, which which you know I think we need more of in our industry, 
He's, he's, Kubernetes he's, was he's born king. that way. Yeah. Kubernetes was born that way. I think a lot of people may not remember when Docker came out. Docker had an API basically to optimize doing things on a single system. Yeah. And Docker tried to extend that API almost as is to represent managing apps across multiple systems. And honestly, that just API just wasn't suitable. And so when Kubernetes came on the scene, we looked at that API and said, you know what, we need to design something different. And we started with use cases. You know, an application is usually a logical thing. It requires more than one container to actually do its thing. But also we were thinking about, well, how would you articulate things like health checks? And so when we designed that schema, we, we asked ourselves, like, what does that look like? What things make sense to people? And so we would talk to people. We would actually run, <clears throat> you run some analysis and say, how are people doing health checks today? What are the industry standards? And can the API capture those? Maybe not allowing people to do it only one way, but just high level enough. And then we actually started small every single time. We add a field, we observe its usage, <clears throat> and we prog propagate it all the way up to maybe beta, where we have one last opportunity to change or extend based on real world usage, and we have another go at it. But I think the KRM, the Kubernetes resource model, is probably one good example. <clears throat> one good example of seeing the infrastructure world realize we should be designing our infrastructure tools, not just scripting them. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and that that seems key to me in this move to be able to do what we've been talking about in terms of raise that level of abstraction. You know, to, you know, we're trying to hide detail. You know, at, at all layers in our system. Very often, it seems to me. I I I, I wrote a book about. Um, my thoughts on what modern software engineering is like is it, about, and one of the key I divide into two groups of principles. One of them is optimizing for learning and the other one's optimizing to manage complexity. And that second group seems key to design, to good design to me, which K Kubernetes clearly is in terms of being able to, you know, apply what, what at least in the way that I think about it, ideas like modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction and couple, you know, coupling with the preference towards loose coupling in order to be able to hide information in a way that allows you to make change anywhere in the system without breaking anywhere else in the system. And, and Kubernetes seems to be doing a fantastic job of being able to do that for some quite complicated things, but it takes that abstraction that I think that you're talking about, is, is the way that I would think about it.